Welcome to Creating a Culture of Abundance and Equity, and it's going to be featuring lessons from our friends and partners at the Learning Tree. I'd like to go through um, a land acknowledgement, and while I do that, I invite you to um, introduce yourself um, with the traditional lands of where you're calling in from. Um, so Tamarack conducts its work across Turtle Island, which is the ancestral lands of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. And we recognize um, that Indigenous rights holders um, to these lands are really important to form these reciprocal relationships um, as we do work with both Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities and find ways to do that um, in the spirit of reciprocity. And um, right now I could share that at Tamarack, we're reflecting on topics such as um, how can two-eyed two seeing benefit this conversation? Or what does decolonization mean? What does it look and feel like in the community spaces that we belong to? Um, as a settler-led charitable organization, we're also um, trying to understand what our role is in truth and reconciliation, um, being uncomfortable sitting in that truth as we move into the um, phase of reconciliation. And just some of the actions that we've taken um, include using Indigenous place names and publications that we're starting to move towards that at Tamarack. Um, we, last year we hosted an Indigenous cultural workshop with staff um, through Kwasananu with Indigenous Insight. And um, we're currently developing an Indigenous-led webinar on um, relationship building between Indigenous communities and local governments. And I invite you, if you're interested in that topic, to reach out and contact me. Um, we also want to acknowledge those of us who came here as settlers as, and migrants, either in this generation or generations past, and those of us who came here involuntarily, particularly those brought to these lands as a result of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. And we want to pay tribute to ancestors of African origin and descent. And um, really doing an African ancestral acknowledgement, it's something that's new at Tamarack, um, but it's our way to commit to dismantling systemic anti-Black racism that's resulted in inequity for Black communities across Canada um, related to financial security, a sense of belonging, educational, criminal justice policy, and much more. Um, personally, for me, as a daughter of immigrants from Trinidad and acknowledging that we're here in Black Futures Month, um, it's important to give voice to issues impacting Black communities, not only as a way to reduce disparity gaps, but also to work to build belonging in communities um, that recognize the histories of our neighbors. So I just wanna preface that you might be hearing ABCD a lot through the conversations today. And when I say ABCD or any of our panelists, um, it stands for Asset-Based Community Development. Um, we're joined by Diyama and Harjis from The Learning Tree. Um, he's a faculty member of the ABCD Institute, community organizer, creator of The Learning Tree, and chairperson of the Grassroots Scrapmakers Association Board, and featured in the new documentary, The Antidote on Kindness in America. I invite you to really check out that documentary. Um, he's a frequent speaker on ABCD in secular and religious groups around the world and a lay person at Broadway UMC Indianapolis. And Yaman's role is to listen and discover the gifts, passions, and dreams of citizens in his community and to find ways to utilize them to build a community, economy, and mutual delight. Welcome, Diyama. And Do you have any words that you want to share with us before we get started? No, but honored to be coming from the land of the Iroquois, Potawatomi, and Miami. And it's places I grew up on, but thank you for the invitation. Thank you. And next, I want to introduce Mark Latta. Um, he's the Vice President of Pos Positive Deviance Culture and Research at The Learning Tree. Um, his background includes curriculum design, academics, the humanities, policy, asset-based work, and media. He was the Assistant Professor of English at Marion University and served as the university's former Director of Community Engaged Learning. His research and teaching interests focus on the intersections between community engagement, social change, and the ways literacy is used to resist oppression and enact futures. Um, he gained his first experience teaching through the AmeriCorps team of service at Pendleton Juvenile Correctional Facility and remains involved in commercial education as a Women's College Partnership faculty member. And he's also been involved in numerous social arts projects, so bringing some joy to this work that he's taken up. Um, he currently directs Poetic Justice, a peace building and crime prevention project integrating poetry, creative writing, and ABCD. 
and he holds multiple certifications in asset-based and restorative practices. He's a PhD candidate in urban education studies programs at the Indiana University of Indianapolis. And I should have invited, I should have like told him to bring some poetry to open up the space with us. But um, Mark, do you have any words that you want to share with us before we get started? Uh, just that I'm I'm happy to be here, Rochelle, and I uh, want to acknowledge that currently sitting on the traditional lands of the Miami and the Kickapoo. Thanks, Mark. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rochelle Ignacio. I'm the Director of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion for Tamarack Institute. Um, I come from a community building, volunteerism, advocacy background myself, work that I still do um, where I'm located, which is Treaty 6 territory, home of the Nehiya, Dene, Anishabe, Nakota Iska, and Nitsitapi people, as well as Métis Region 4. Um, I, my passion, my focus area is anti-racism and developing EDI strategies, um, and I'm the moderator for today's conversation. I meet regularly with both Diamond and Mark, so I'm really excited to be here today. And you'll also see that Jorge has joined us, um, and he'll be going over some some upcoming opportunities at the end of this call. So Jorge is our Associate Director of um, Communities Building Belonging. And Jorge, do you wanna share anything before we get started? Um, just want to thank everyone for, for joining us for this important conversation as we build belonging in ways that are authentic, respectful, and based on um, networks of solidarity. Thank you. Thanks, Jorge. And I just want to thank everyone that's um, engaged in the chat so far, sharing the traditional lands of where you're from, and feel free to ask questions, talk with one another throughout this call today. So I'm going to jump right into our first question. Um, this one's for both Diamond and Mark. So I'll first go to Diamond and then Mark can follow up. And I know each of you have some rich examples um, of where you've like had the shift from a deficit mindset into speaking about a culture of abundance. And um, as a second part to that question, um, beyond the examples, if you can follow up how the shift can contribute to fostering equity in communities. So first, Diamon. Well, I think uh, the original space that I look at is where we live at. And so um, the idea first changing the question about our neighbors and I live in places where uh, folks that look like me, meaning black and brown um, residents, uh, people who live and work and worship in the place. Um, oftentimes we are asked about our deficits. So the first thing we um, do is ask what people can teach someone else how to do. And the other thing is what brings you joy and what skills, gifts, and talents do you have? And in our neighborhood, what has been discovered is that where formerly we call a food desert is now an opportunity to think about people who grow things. And so um, there's about 110 backyard gardeners um, in about 10 block radius around my house. Um, the other thing is that uh, thinking about philanthropy, we, we're thinking about, um, oftentimes you don't think about neighborhoods like mine, uh, as philanthropists because they don't have a, a large area of medium income. But the idea that there were about $75,000 worth of philanthropic cash in this low income neighborhood and the whole ingredient is changing the question. It's like, do we believe in the premise that everybody has something to offer? So 10 years later into the work, it, we're developing a city block corridor and this is not an institution. This is a group of residents doing affordable housing. And I think those are like kind of base level examples, but it's done by changing the question from a deficit question to an abundance. Thank you. Um, what about these like community gardens? Like, is it like, can you explain like where it is? I think it's an interesting Absolutely. concept. Absolutely. I, I think, um, a lot of people uh, dream about this caveat of having community gardens and meaning that there's residents that come together. I am talking about individual uh, gardeners. So Taisha Ahmed, who now has a nonprofit, but when she first started, she just bought empty lots and to restore the lots and she hired young people in her community. 
to be junior master gardeners. So Taisha Ahmed runs a little outfit called uh, Anna Loves Garden, and she lives like two blocks away. Right. And so that's a specific example. And then you got Mr. Clarence in the Midwest grows a hundred pounds of peanuts and he's an elder in our neighborhood. Right. And they sometimes get together and share secrets. But there's not one place that people come to. These are people's, these were already created before the word community garden was created. Thank you. Um, it's just interesting to like hear about some of those like real rich life examples and people and um, how they're really like forming different relationships. I love that, like the peanut story and talking about different uh, secrets. Um, Mark, do you have anything you want to offer? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, we're, a lot of our work is, uh, you know, it's aimed toward the shift toward an abundance perspective or asset based perspective. There are a lot of different words we could use to, to talk about this, but I think, um, for us, it's it's movement. It's an intentional movement away from this this default setting that we're kind of situated in about just seeing deficits. And so, I think when when we talk about deficits, that's really reducing people and communities down to problems and needs. Um, and and it's and it's in many ways, I think deficit thinking is kind of the the engine of a consumerist culture and settler colonialism. Because it allows people to be convinced that, you know, they need something in order to feel better or that there's something inherently wrong with them or there's something inherently wrong with their community. And therefore, uh, you know, they need a solution. They need someone to come in and fix it. And so there's a lot of language in, in thinking about fixing things. And, and so it, the work that we try to do is to well, first is to, to get out of that mentality Um Instead of instead of looking for problems or needs, looking for gifts and talents and the things that bring people joy. And then the second thing is to recognize that those things, those gifts and talents that that people have, right? Like uh, you know, you can you can not have a lot, but still have many gifts and talents. Um, that those are sources of joy and that's a source of power. And and so I think um, you know, in talking about kind of this shift. Um, we're in the, I think we're, we're in the game of trying to learn as much as we are trying to unlearn. Um, because there, are, you know, many cultures, uh, children, children kind of operate in this abundance mindset by default. And it's only when they kind of grow up and become enculturated, do they, do they get kind of pushed into this deficit mindset? So I think some of the work that we're trying to do is to kind of move back into, the space uh, and imagination of abundance. I think one of the ways that happens when we discover people's gifts, oftentimes with the gardeners itself, their um, Ratisha and some of her friends are now plugged in to systems that now have to learn from them. So how we start with that is like once we discover a bunch of gardeners, we put them in the same room and to announce the power they have. So that's a big space. And we often do that space with, with artists. We find some way to lay platform to what's already there. So another example, there are about 45 artists around our space. Um, we, several years ago, our first project was to pay our neighbors to tell stories on the front and back of doors. And what we ended up with is the 100 doors we couldn't have, uh, we couldn't store. And so they ended up on people's porches. But people who would come through our neighborhood would start to notice like what's going on here well guess what that was already there and so partly bringing them together to see each other to see resident power so it's not just good to have one story it is good to like illustrate that so we do that by small gatherings together and then what we try to do like mark's role is brilliant him and wild style try to figure out how do we share these stories for people who need these folks so Several years ago, um, IU Health, because of this, started a um, a a group of gardeners uh, at the IU Health to for our neighbors to give produce to their lowest paid employees and the rest of their employees that were struggling with diabetes. Before, what would happen in that relationship was that they would come propose a a program for us, but now they they realize that. 
wait a minute, we're missing something. We need these residents. And so for us convening that and sharing the story was also a big part of that space. Thank you. <clears throat> um, it's really like a theme of like finding out those like gifts, sources of joy, the power that's really creating like a culture, a new culture for that community. I love that thread. Um, Mark, just one quick follow up. I was wondering how like poetic justice feeds into this culture of abundance and finding those like talents. Yeah, that's a great question, Rochelle. Thank you. So poetic justice is um, it's an ongoing project of discovery, right? And what we try to do is we use we use poetry uh, as a tool for both personal discovery and discovery of language to begin to describe a world that we want to help create, right? And um, it emerged from this space of crime prevention or violence reduction. Uh, and th that's the language that you'll you'll find used in, in the United States quite a bit, where the there's funding and there's there are measurements and assessments for the rates of crime. And there's, you know, the number of people who are shot and killed and horrible things that happen to them. But there's there's little in the way of peace building. And and really if you dig into it, like when we were actually talking about crime prevention, we're really talking about building peace, except we don't really talk about that, right? So poetic justice, I think, was an attempt for us to say, look, building peace and discovering joy and being connected in joy, that's a that's a that's a condition of peace. So let's aim for that. And that I think that's an example of shifting to an abundance mindset where everyone has an ability to contribute to peace. And there's a, we operate from a belief that that peace is possible. Um, we don't we're not motivated primarily by reducing crime. Instead, we're motivated by increasing and cultivating peace with the idea that when we do that, well, violence will naturally decrease. And so I think maybe that's that's an example of how we kind of apply this shift from a, um, a project perspective. Awesome. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to shift to our next question for a Diamond. And I'm curious how to know how you integrate culturally informed methods into your work of building belonging at the community level. And I'm particularly interested in like those experiences and people that have impacted um, this cultural methods for you. Uh, hi, Gwen. I see my friend Gwen Barley on. Um, so a couple of things I feel like uh, what allowed me to bring stuff like this was friendship in the first place. Like if you go back, you know, my resume is all good, but if I was on a regular job market, I don't have the skills and qualifications. So I was just writing about this, how, how did I get to a place? And I say friendship is first. So my friendship with Mike Mather, who once you friends, you believe you're supposed to be in this space. And what happened because of friendship, they get to bring, my experiences and so that was one big space the other thing i learned in this was that uh the practice of of interdisciplinary learning journeys it's been a practice i've been involved with and probably leading for like 10 years it's taking groups of people who don't look like each other for one to take a journey to 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 be imaginative around spaces so what that looks like and giving you a specific examples. And we do this in two ways. We don't have like an office, our offices are our hot homes. So we're a real like labeled grassroots group that we got to register. Oftentimes um, because of our stories and the stories we kick out, people want to come visit. And the big question we ask is what, before you engage in relationship there's critical questions. What do you want to share or give up? Power do you want to share? Uh, what are you willing to, uh, who are you willing to learn from? And what new things are you willing to imagine with these folks? And so what we do is we call our neighbors who are folks that may have credentials or may not, mostly not, to be the teachers. Because if you want to be on this journey, we invite them to be the ones lifted up. So we often do that. But the other thing we do and have a time that just 
kind of exploded my own thinking is that we started with these learning journeys and we took a single mom, an artist, a professor, um, a pastor, and we took a trip. And we often take trips to places together. And we went to see a guy named Dr. John Rich. And he wrote the book, Wrong Place, Wrong Time, as a medical doctor. Anyway, we was looking at his book of, like he had been hiring uh, people for the health crew. And met, that was people who, that were black and brown who were stabbed and shot being the advocates for anti-violence work. So anyway, we go up there and I remember I just got out of jail. I come back and we're sitting with this group and he asked us three questions. One was the first question, which I really like, how do you feel right now? And I said, free. So hours, I was just walking out of uh, place. The second was, the second two questions were really powerful. He said, who are the healers in your neighborhood? And then how do you support those healers? Jeez, after that, our brains exploded because we were able to ask the first answer the first questions like Miss Rose, uh, Miss Jackson, those are our healers. But we never could ask how we do those. That learning journey in between, we went to have a beer, a dinner. We started to bond in ways that built some way. Well, why don't we think about this? Well, for us, that's why you that's why we hire a healer on on the staff of the learning tree you know and so what we hope in those in those spaces is not the folks who come in from institutions i mean they have to say yes but it's also the residents that's willing to walk and say i want something to do better and putting them in the same room in a journey so learning journeys and ways we've we've done that and it's resulted in so many different new relationships in the city of Indianapolis. Thank you. That reminds me like here in Edmonton at the Edmonton Public Library, we have an elder in residence and just now I'm like starting to make some connections of like how that is thinking about abundance and the gifts that indigenous people hold and how like an institution like a library can demonstrate and role model that for the broader community. Um, Rochelle, you, 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 you've also took us on learning journeys in Edmonton too. Yeah. For us to be learners of your community. So that was a, a really good example of that. Yeah. Just opening those doors and connections. Um, okay, I'm gonna move us along. I also just want to say if you want to contribute to this conversation, um, the chat is available. So I think on the bottom of your screen there'll be a little QA button and you can submit any questions. And Jamie and Jorge will also monitor the chat to see if there's anything that gets dropped in there. Um, but this question is for both of you. In a world where resources are limited, how can we measure the impact of community efforts? And how does this conversation translate to funders that continue to operate from a colonial mindset? So maybe we'll hear from Mark first and then over to Diamond. Yeah, this is an interesting question. Um, and my computer is going to interrupt me. But, um, you know, so I think the first thing is uh, I'm not, I'm not fully convinced yet that we live in a world with limited resources. Uh, I mean, I, I hear that a lot, right? Um, but I think what's more true is that we live in a world with very limited attention spans and a limited desire to direct resources to certain communities and certain um, ideas. Uh, and so I think, you know, thinking about a lot of our work is connected to foundations that that like ourselves come from these colonial roots, right? So we have to navigate that terrain. But so I think the first thing we should do is, you know, is this a resource problem or is this an imagination problem? Um, and and a lot of times it's it's an imagination problem. The resources, if you get people who are inspired and activated, um, and and feel good uh, about doing something, and you know joy becomes a measure of assessment as much as it just becomes a measure of, of, of living. Um, usually those people will find resources that they need, whether they are financial or otherwise. And, and so I think um, challenging this notion is, is really important, especially for uh, white folks like me who can, maybe are a bit more accustomed to navigating these spaces where we can have those honest conversations around boardroom tables and say, 
uh, sure resources may need to be, um, you know, administered in a particular way, but let's be honest about what's driving those choices. I, th I think that's that's the first thing. Um, and the, the second thing is to really begin to challenge um, this, I, the, the role of discovery. Uh, and so one of the things Diamond and, and Mike Mather and I were recently talking about is uh, how we should be aiming for discoverables instead of deliverables. And, and the more that we engage in the act of discovery is really kind of a future investment in ourselves and our, and our communities. And so I think that that comes into play in this question um, because foundations have or should have a role in making sure this work is fostering discovery and not just uh, you know ending up with a list of things that are going to be shoved into uh, a file cabinet. How would you say, like, if there's someone out there who has this funder relationship and they want to imagine and they want to shift into this like world of discovery and they're like, I really need this funding in order to move forward this initiative. So how do you balance like taking that funding and the evaluation that's set in place, but also having that conversation with a funder to like shift into discovery or at least open the door, maybe not on that specific project, but open that conversation. Do you have any tidbits of wisdom to share with us? Well, I do, but they they pale in comparison to what Diamond could provide because this is one of his gifts. And so I think uh, it would behoove everyone for me to stop talking and to let him talk a little bit about this. I, well, Mark, I, I disagree. I think one of the things that uh, I was thinking about that happened uh, a few months ago, I think when you were talking about poetic justice, uh, the best example right now to me that you've had is you weren't always part of the learning tree in the formal sense. So poetic justice, uh, you used your, utilized the relationships at your institutions to leverage the idea that you bring in residents to the table to walk alongside you to create this poetic justice. Now that's powerful, right? Because what, what happened, he leveraged his, uh, this relationship piece. And that's where I'm going with this. Also, if we are only thinking about physical resources, then we've already lost. Like the thing we bring most to each other is the potential for friendships. And no matter how we slice it, no grant is given because you wrote a good grant. There is some relationship actually tied, whether it's in the message that you capture, but usually it's in people. So for an example, just this morning, I have a tense relationship with a community foundation local to Indianapolis. And it's talking about the same thing, needing data. And one of the things we've collected was tons of data about potential. The problem is, is that we're in a system that can't utilize and process this type of data because it has no use for it, right? To say there's potential and resources. The other thing that I have been able to do is to leverage really interesting relationships on a national and a local level all of us get together to say, hey, we start with coffee and we start with the main questions. What is our birth story, right? And we and we walk and see, is there potential in this relationship that can change things? So for the example, for an example of the community foundation, not only am I saying you should fund different, but here's a group of people you should put money in the hands because they are philanthropists. And we would invite them into the space to do that. So anyway, and it's been tense, right? It's not an easy thing to make this shift, but those are ways that we have been able to at least have to create a new table for conversation. I think um, <clears throat> you speak to like a really important point is, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, but you're like this like community connector of some sort where you can have these conversations and you're not doing it to the benefit of your own project, but you're doing it for the benefit of the community and bringing in these philanthropists within the community into the conversation. Um, because like when your community is healthy, ultimately you're healthy as well. So believe um, it or not, you, do you know who have the potential to do this? Thanks. They were created to create currency, right? Not just money. But social capital, it was a place where people shared to go. Everybody know when you was getting your check, you walk to the bank, and then conversations would start, right? Banks knew 
who had dreams <laughs> about what they want to do. So I would consider myself a social banker. There, you gave the title that I <laughs> was struggling to find. Mark, do you have anything that you wanted to add on to this question? Yeah, yeah, I think I think this is a really important question. It's a question that comes up a lot, particularly with people who are doing this type of work about, well, how do I translate this to language that my funder or government agency is expecting to hear? And I think I think Diamond's absolutely right. Number one, it comes down to a relationship, right? Like you have to be able to talk to people like they're people, and you have to be seen uh, in the way that you want to be seen. And and I know that's a lot of times easier said than done, um, but that's such that's just a foundational part of this shift from deficit to abundance. Um, the other thing is that joy is not just a benchmark of of doing positive work, but it's also a way of assessing the work. But it's um, you know, like like Diamond pointed out, like most foundations aren't set up to use that as data because it's all deficit driven, right? Um, I think the only other thing I would mention, you know, in a former life when I was in, when I was in academia, um, you know, I, I was, I was the person who would fund projects or who would collaborate and, and provide resources. And, uh, you know, a question that would always drive my work is, you know, can we imagine a world in which whatever issue a person is trying to tackle, can we imagine a world in which that is no longer an issue? Um, and and if the answer is no, then that to me means that we need, okay, we need to dedicate more resources to this because there, we need to find those people who are imagining new ways of doing things and providing them with as many resources as possible until we can get to a place where we can begin to imagine a world where whatever is, is, is challenging and causing a problem is no longer um, the same. And and that that is like that's that's what what drives I think a lot of the work that we do. Thank you. There's been um a lot of talk about like imaginist imaginist um and like this imagination thinking and I think there maybe like for the audience would either of you want to like speak to what being an imaginist is really fundamentally. Well, I think a couple of things I realize is not a. It's not just a mindset, it's a practice. Um, one of the things that Mark and I, early on in our relationship, we had talked about archetypes. And one of the things when we found things work well in municipality, there were imaginators, is what we call them. And there are folks who can think, create, not only think, but act creatively um, in times of scarcity to produce something. And so some of our earliest is... Uh, I think it was Socrates was in the fight with uh, with some of the folks there. And I think, and there's just toward the time of famine, but in that time of famine, people survive by playing games. And that's where the work, the, the, the game Bones was created, right? All the things we do, roll dice. And people, they did it because they conserved energy. Now that's creative. Mark's title itself, the positive deviant, right? An academic term in action. Those are folks who are imaginators, artists, poets, um, strategists. Um, those are, are examples and you know them in your neighborhoods. They're very visible, but it's not about them. Thanks. Yeah, I think... Um... For me, the imagination is 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 tied closely to a concept called futurity, um, which for me comes from uh, someone who's she's a indigenous researcher, Goodyear Kuape. Uh, she writes a lot about futurity, and futurity basically means the 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 ways in which people make knowledge about future possibilities or future worlds, right? And I think that and maybe this has also become because I came from an education space. Um, and I and one of the things that kind of broke my heart as an educator is that um, a lot of my students didn't get to a place where they could where they, where they fully believe that the world was a place that they could create. 
or that the world was a place that they could disrupt or shape. And, and to me, that speaks from a lack of imagination, a uh, lack of imagination that, that was brought about by a system that benefits when all of us or most of us stop imagining other ways of doing things. And so I think that futurity and imagination, um, much like joy, are those personal forms of decolonization that we can engage in on a daily basis. And so therefore, um, those of us who count ourselves as elders, it's really important that we cultivate that among those who are younger than us. And also learn, like, I feel like I'm learning about futurism and imagination from like younger people who are really like challenging us to imagine like a new way of doing things that we don't have to like stay in this like deficit mindset and how we can like cultivate these relationships that are needed to move forward. Um, Mark, I'm going to keep asking you this next question. Um, based on the experiences that you have encountered in your engagement activities, what are examples of practices that can cultivate strong relationships with residents and how you demonstrate allyship in the process? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, and just to be clear, I don't really have an answer to that. I don't, I don't, I mean, the whole idea of allyship, I think is so important, but we're, I'm, I'm suspicious of any time uh, like a white guy says, I've got allyship, figured it out. You know, like, okay, well, probably not. So I, I don't want I don't want to give you anyone the impression that I've got this figured out. But I think what it comes down to for me is just stop talking and listening. Um, you know, Diamon, I've learned a lot from following him around and going on learning journeys with him. And one of the things that he really does really well is he can hone in quickly on what what makes people excited. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, like what what gets them excited to get up off the couch to, you know, face the world, to go out the front door. Um, and and when you're able to to listen to people talk about that in a way that, you know, you're actually listening for what they have to say, as opposed to listening to, to interrupt. Uh, that can that can collapse a lot of barriers. And so I think the most important thing is to listen, but then to also listen in spaces that may that aren't your usual spaces um i think a lot of times people who want to be allies uh, are willing to do that on neutral ground or they're willing to do that if if people come to them but if you, if you ask those those same people who want to be allies uh if you invite them into um a space that they're unfamiliar with or perhaps even afraid uh, then all these different types of barriers begin to come up. Um, and we need to pay attention to that because for me, that's that's an indication that I there's some there's something internally in me that resists entering into this space. And if I'm resisting entering into a space, I'm probably also not going to be comfortable and can't listen fully and can't be present. And so that's something that needs to be attended to. So listening and listening in the spaces of others, I think are two important things. I think you also like mentioned something on the topic of like a community being able to invite people in, but then that person needing to like be open and curious to accepting that invitation with like wholeheartedness. Um, something that I think we get a lot at Tamarack, especially is from like a community and neighborhood level is how do you like do this engagement with diverse communities with people who don't look like you? Um, Diam, and you might want to speak to this, like you mentioned, uh, that interdisciplinary journey of like getting people together that are all different, but I think people are really scared. And so to, can either of you maybe like share some of those ways where we could just open up those doors? Well, I want to remind Mark, he often uses the word uh, conspiracy and um, he is a great conspirator. And that's what we can ask for for our white allies. So, so I wanted to close that tour. And he often says, uses that. Um, the other thing is I, I feel like once people, I think one of the reasons why I look for what people have power to do is that that is equity. Once everybody can see their own gifts, then what happens, and this is myself included, is that we start to develop like grace. And, and for me, meaning that I've had instances 
though I'm saying for checking out people's gifts and talents. I've also hit the mark short because people don't look like me. And partly what that means is developing, and I'm always reminded by my friends that say, maybe you should give this person a chance. And so partly saying that for us as organizers that are on the ground, the biggest uh, uh, place, role you can play as a convener. And so finding ways, one, to celebrate people. So parties is one of our biggest acts of uh, restorative like relationships, to restore relationships, because parties are where people become their truest self. And so, and I mean, not a party with a bunch of, uh, you know, pamphlets and stuff, but a real party, a fiesta, right? So this idea that and then what we say, and my neighbors are really brilliant at this, won't you invite this dude? Because I'm often hanging out with also folks that have perceived resources. And they would say, well, what would it look like you get all of these folks just to see their power together? So that's one way I think it's a practice that we do uh, and how we try to invite not only individuals, but institutions into that space to be good neighbors. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move to our last question. And then we have an audience question that has come in as well from Hannah. Um, so here in Canada, we have our own examples of redlining that have impacted communities such as Africville in Nova Scotia or Hogan's Alley in Vancouver. And from your own perspective, what's the impact of policies such as redlining on equity deserving communities? And how can individuals begin the process of building community with an abundance mindset? despite not having all their available resources at their disposal. Mark, you try first. Um, well, so I, I will say, you know, a lot of a lot of the um a lot of the work that that I uh, am involved in and that we are involved in Learning Tree um in many ways can also be understood as as repair work, uh, community repair work. And what it is that we are repairing are or undoing are really, you know, the ongoing impacts of redlining. We um most of the urban cities and urban geographies in North America or in the United States, particularly in what we consider the, the northern United States, uh, have been dramatically and 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 reshaped um through redlining in ways that are really difficult to fully uh understand from our current perspective um and so i think it's easy to feel a sense of despair in this work because the problems seem so structural they seem so deeply ingrained in the structure um but we have histories of communities who refuse to be sequestered, who refuse to be uh, policed, who refuse, uh, you know, to be arranged in particular ways. And so I think it's important for us to always, one, to learn from those communities. And two, regardless of how deep these problems seem, it always starts with listening. And so that that for us, um, when we when we take the time to listen and build relationships, um, that's how we discover the community healers. That's how we discover the social bankers. That's how we discover the imaginators. Those are the people we need to be in conversation with um, to to do the work of repair. And and and, and those those discoveries are going to make I believe make it possible for us to to begin that work of repair. I, I, I would say the impact of these type of policies is not is me not being friends and sitting here on the Zoom with all of you, Rochelle and Mark, and now Jorge, new friend, and Jamie, you know, and I would be less off better and Mark would be less off better if we had never met. And, and I say that the time in the civil rights in this country, we said we had strive for is you never hear it now the word integration you do hear the word gentrification and i feel like it, that is the impact that continues to happen not as in, intentional or it is intentional but it's not like 
it's subversive, right? The idea that because he works as an academic and a community organizer couldn't be friends and have dinner together. So that's the impact of that. We're all less off better. The other thing is that the same, the, the reason that Mark and I are friends is because of good practices. He brought Pat practices, he does listen. Right. The other thing is he uses his power to lift up stories of other folks. Right. And so I, I I get to benefit from that. But not only that, my neighbors benefit from that. Right. And examples like this, uh, the practices that do that benefit everybody. So what is that? Identifying where people have power and celebrating that. Uh, find ways to publicly acknowledge what is possible, right? And then celebrate the heck out of being in love with each other. And so those are the spaces. I know that seems like, oh, that's that's a cheese. Let's let's give that a try. All through this conversation, I've heard about like the power of this relationship, power of listening, um, and how it really can open some of those doors. I want to move uh, first to Gwen's uh, question, which seems related to this thread of um, when you're doing this listening, when you're like engaging with communities, when you're engaging with people who are different, how do you know a healer when you meet one or a social bank banker or the imaginator? How would you spot one? What are those qualities you'd be looking for? Go ahead, Mark. Two, two. Talking about. Uh, I mean, Pay attention to when their eyes light up, right? Like ask them, ask them how they spend their time. Um, watch them. You know what? What do they? What do they notice? What do they tend to? What? Uh, you know how do they? How do they structure their day? I think you know this is as much a art as it is anything else. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think you know we we've we've done some of this work and Diamond's done some of this work of like developing our understanding of these different archetypes like the community healer and the social banker um but but these are these are usually this is how people move through the world right like they aren't these things because we've said here's your new title they are these things because this is how they move through the world and there's evidence of that uh you know that they, they however we all move through the world we leave evidence of that throughout our day and so i think some of it is just paying attention to that yeah mary oliver has uh her advice on living pay attention be astonished and tell about it i live that we try to live that in our work is probably there but here's an example of what mark said and so uh healers i i shot med who you hear me reference or january york i know that the healers one they do the work of healers to five o'clock right they are they're folks that you can call that when somebody is in trouble they're going to figure out ways to connect them they're often very good hosts uh they mean that's an example of doing that and we all if i if i start let me see another one the uh um, the social banker right the person is always connecting somebody and they're not paid to do it and they believe everybody should be connected and they do it bad or good. They're always using their gifts in that way. And the imaginator, they're always coming up with some ideas, <laughs> some great plan and know who needs to be involved. So it is going back to what Mark said. I think what he said is just pay attention to listen and then go purposely take, you have to go look for these folks. You can't just say they're just going to appear. I resonate with some of that. Like, um, I think something that I've been doing here in Edmonton is like building spaces for community to gather and really celebrate the Black community. And there's so many times where I'm like, I'm tired. I don't want to do this anymore. And it's like my toxic addiction, addiction, like people come to me with an idea or I like, I dream of a new one and I'm like doing it again. And it's really like, whether you're a healer or a social banker, it's like sometimes what your calling is to do and you just can't help yourself. Um, yeah, I think I think that's really important. Like, there are a lot of us who who just can't not do certain things. Yeah. Right. And like, so pay attention to those. <laughs> well, 
We have one last question before we start to wrap up and it's from Hannah. Um, so what has surprised or maybe delighted you the most in the work that you're doing and maybe those like moments where your eyes are lighting up? And I'm just go back to friendships and the joy of parties of celebrating what's been discovered or uncovered. And that's why I do particularly keep doing this because I don't have to do it by myself. Uh, I think one of the things that has really surprised and energized me is um, in many ways, this work transcends political ideologies. And um, we can, I think it's possible to get to a space where it doesn't matter. Uh, our political identities, just these different identities begin to fall away. Um, not all of them, and nor, nor should they. Um, but it's, and it also, it just feels better. It, it feels good. Uh, a lot of the work that we do, you know, I saw some of the comments in here, Diamon, why have a meeting when we can have a party? Like Diamon throws a lot of parties um, because they, they cultivate, they foster joy. There's not enough space for joy in most of our lives. Uh, and it doesn't require purchase of a product. It doesn't require the purchase of anything. It just requires us to come together. Thank you for those uh, closing comments. I wonder if you might tell us about a party you're holding in May. In May. Sure. So actually, this is really good because um, we're throwing, it's our 10 year anniversary. We hired some young people and then as old folks forgot, older people forgot that we had been existing for 10 years. And so in May, May uh, 15th through the 18th, we're doing what we call the common ground gathering and have some exciting, um, you know, storytellers, local, very uh, local lens to this, where the learning will be happening um, through grassroots folks on the topics of data, affordable housing, community well-being, uh, and asset-based community development. Awesome. So join us. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's going to be a party. It's going to be a whole vibe. So I've put the link to the Eventbrite in the chat if you want to check that out. Um, I want to extend my gratitude first to Jorge and Jamie. They've demonstrated amazing thought leadership, administrative, technical support, really like the brains behind uh, what we're what we got to witness and observe in the space together today. Um, and really thanks to Diamond and Mark uh, for sharing your gifts and wisdom with us. Um, I like some of the points that I pulled out was looking at deficits that's really reducing the community down to problems and needs and um, how we need to look at the gifts and talents which are a source, source of joy and power um, that interdisciplinary learning learning from groups of people who don't look like one another and how we can be imaginative and think about the future um, thinking about like what we're willing to give up what do we want to learn and really challenging the notion that we have limited resources um, and that if we think we have a resource problem, that it's maybe an imagination problem and what can we lend beyond physical assets um, to solve that issue. Um, there's a link to the survey or we'll be doing a survey. So make sure to fill that out. And I just want to turn it over to Jorge to give us some more cl closing comments. Thanks, Rochelle. Thank you so much, Diamon. And thank you, Mark, for this wonderful conversation. Um, so um, just before we go, we have some um, announcements, some learning opportunities. So you you should have received the link to the Learning Trees website, where you can learn more about the work that they're doing and also their own conference in May. Um, in terms of the work that we're doing at Tamarack um, for communities here in Canada, we are excited to, uh, to share with you the circle of actions. This is a seven month learning cohort designed to help communities develop and uh, um, whether it's a plan, a strategy, or an intervention that centers belonging at the heart of their work. Um, it's a great opportunity to help you get on stock on some ideas that you're dealing with, and uh, um, or even like move faster in terms of uh, work that is critical for you. So I'm just going to share with you the link to the circle of action so you can learn more about it. And uh, I shared it Oh, sorry? I shared it. I'm sharing the oh, link. You shared it? Okay, oh, awesome. Thank you. 
Um, so yeah, you can um, you so you can use that link to learn more about the circle of actions, and you can also email me at the email address that is in the chat box. There's also the strategy for belonging. That is a huge movement that we're co-creating from coast to coast to coast to uh, center the voices, the gifts, and the aspirations of communities in developing a strategy for belonging. We want to do it together. We can't do it alone. We are not the ones owning it. We're just inviting you and hosting the party <laughs> so that we can uh, have a conversation on what a strategy could look like between now and 2025. The details are available in the um, link that Rochelle shared with us through the chat box. And we also want to invite you to consider signing the pledge for a belonging strategy. And um, we also have a couple of webinars that uh, we've designed to, to help you in your learning journey. So there's this one on navigating multiple crises on February 28th. Uh, this is looking at the role of system, systematic mediation for transformative change with our colleague Miriam Berube. Um, Luisa Dongo and Jean Noé Landry. Um, it's going to be a great conversation. Hopefully, you can join us. And there's also our asset based community development, community practice. Uh, we're hosting the COP for practitioners in Canada and the States to, um, to have conversations on what ABCD looks like in your local context and, we, and lessons to learn from each other's experiences. So, the next one is on March 27 at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, thanks, Rochelle, for sharing the links to those two offerings for our communities. And um, I think that's it on my end. Um, I don't think we have other announcements. Yeah, that's that's it. So thank you, everyone, for joining us one more time for this webinar. And thanks, Rochelle, for your being our amazing uh, moderator of these conversations. And uh, Diamon and Mark, thanks for sharing your wisdom with us one more time. And thanks, Jamie, for being with us. Thank you.